All right, to start this off, let's all take a moment and kind of think back to 2015, right? You're on your couch, Netflix is on in the background, you're scrolling your LinkedIn feed. What do you remember being the kind of the key theme back then, right? What was the red thread that we saw as we went through kind of all these, these posts everyone's putting on LinkedIn? Digitalization, right? Big data was one of those words. IoT, autonomous vessels, right? That was the rage back then. Now, that theme has kind of shifted, right? So starting around, let's say, 2018, 2019, that theme is where we're at today, decarbonization. Now, I hope for the sake of our planet that that theme lasts longer than digitalization did. Now, who am I? My name is Michael Rohde. I'm with uh, Cognite. Cognite is a part of the Akker Group in uh, Norway. We're a big oil and gas energy conglomerate, but we include American Shipping Company as well. Uh, Cognite, we are the fastest growing software company in Scandinavia, or maybe even the fastest growing company, mainly active in oil and gas, uh, renewables, um, as well as um, you could also say some, something around power and utility as well, manufacturing. Just a little bit in shipping, just a little bit. But what's been interesting about working with these large energy companies, manufacturing companies over the past years is that I get to see where they benchmark against the maritime when it comes to digitalization. I hate to break it to us all here in this room, but we are far behind, right? Now, what's interesting about that is it's the same drivers, right? Efficiency, reliability, safety. That's what's driving most of these heavy industries. Yet we see that there is a, a higher drive, a higher digital maturity, but also, most importantly, a higher willingness to spend in these other industries as opposed to the maritime. Now, of course, I'm generalizing, and I know I'm upsetting a lot of people here, but I'm generalizing because there are companies in the maritime industry that are pushing the, the boundaries, right? I worked for one for half a decade, Maersk, and I can tell you what we were doing there was truly groundbreaking, and there's other companies beyond Maersk that are pushing that edge. But if we take a step back and we look at this industry from a 30,000-foot view, there's still companies out there that don't even have Ectus, right? I mean, there's the... the, the some of these countries are so far behind, some of these companies are so far behind that it is a monumental task to catch up. So why is this important, right? And this is because decarbonization and digitalization are not mutually exclusive, right? Decarbonization will be driven by digitalization, but vice versa, kind of decarbonization can also pull digitalization, right? So this is what's really important. These two, these two topics are very interlinked. So, this is one point of view, though. This is just my point of view. I'm the contrarian on this one, right? But what we're here to hear from is the panel, because these are people active today driving both of these agendas in the industry. So first, I'm going to kind of go ahead and let everyone introduce themselves, give a quick few minutes of who they are and what they do, and then we'll get to the questions. Christian? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Christian. I'm uh, working with Musk, and uh, I think Michael said it very, very clearly. We're behind. You know, science is absolutely clear, uh, and we need to act now in order to battle climate change. So we in Musk in 2018 committed ourselves to, uh, to uh, join a journey of uh, moving towards zero carbon emission by 2050. And uh, we've come a long way. If you measure it back to, uh, to 2008, we have already reduced uh, 40 six percent of our CO2 emissions, but we still have a long way to go. And everybody know that the first step is probably the easiest part of, of, of the journey. And think a bit about it. Climate changes in shipping, it's huge. And this is also considering that we're probably the industry in the world who are most efficient and in actually getting goods from, from A to B. Um, we in Musk operate around 700 vessels. Uh, and if you put that into a percentage number, that we actually contribute to approximately 0.1% of the total CO2 emissions. So, fuel is not enough. One thing is fuel, but there's a long need also to change a, the supply chain, the ecosystem. We need to embark on that. Uh, so, therefore, we also work very much on digitization and digitized solution. We definitely believe that new report is not enough. Manual reporting data, it's not enough to drive down any deficiency. And I think Maria said it this morning as well, any deficiency continue to be a focus. And 
I can only encourage everybody to join that journey because when we come on new fuels, at least I do not believe that they will become cheaper than the fossil fuels that we have today. So continue to optimizing your NED efficiency. That's a good business case. Uh, so over to you, Son. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Søren, and I'm CEO of Seo uh, North. Uh, as Peter Svod has introduced us, we are we came out of, of Merch Tankers and now are by, owned by uh, Emil Holding and uh, operating as a total independent software company. What we do is we uh, provide and, and build services to uh, mainly the vessel operator onshore. So really, how do we empower those people onshore to take the right decisions? And, and we do that to those operating the vessels, meaning that in this case, we focus on tramp and they actually don't own the vessel. So the, I think it's, it's one of the big themes of the industry is, is misaligned incentives across the industry. And nobody's willing to share data. So what we do is, is we, uh, we empower those operators. So we basically have, I think, around 25,000 different ship models that is uh, delta twins of, of the real vessels. And then through um, connecting with the weather data, with the market rates, with the bunker price, we kind of will be ensure that the operator knows how to get the vessel in a weather safe uh, way from A to B, and where, when, and how much to, to bunker the vessel. And then what we also do after acquiring Proposal Dynamics uh, earlier this summer is that we do a full fuel performance, meaning that we have a full service team that is engaging with the vessel of saying, okay, maybe you should uh, lower your uh, you're burning too much on the exhilarator and then our boiler, and so we're really short-term focused. I think there's like probably five to ten percent optimization that can be done now. And and yes, I do also think that over the longer run we need more sensor data. But if you get a good, accurate new report, that can get you a long way if you just have enough vessels and you just get enough of those data points. So we have around 1,600 vessels committed to use the software as we are speaking across like I think 15 different customers. Um, and keep on growing. We, are, we started last year, uh, in June last year, and now we are uh, these around 1,600 vessels, and we are around 70 people, mainly based here in Copenhagen, and, and keep on growing. We need to be, I guess, 80, 90 people in year. So that's what we do. Hi, my name is Dita Blein, and I'm CEO of uh, Port Exchange. Uh, Port Exchange is a startup founded by the Port of Rotterdam, and our mission as a company is to reduce emissions in uh, shipping worldwide. So that's a very big mission that we've uh, taken on, and our approach has been very pragmatic. So in uh, small experiments starting in the Port of Rotterdam, uh, we built our software, uh, and then uh, from there we uh, took on further deployments in, in other ports. So what we do is we bring together data from different sources operating in the port, so the terminal, the agent, the shipping line, everybody who basically needs to collaborate in a port call process, and that uh, we visualize that data and turn it into information. And then we also add machine learning to really uh, proactively advise people in the port what is going to happen and what is going to go wrong. And that then enables them to uh, take other decisions and also take decisions earlier on in the, in the process. And um, yeah, I agree with what Michael is saying, that uh, we're lagging behind in the maritime industry. But also it's very encouraging to see that if you change something and if you then implement uh, a piece of technology like what we're doing, you also get to very uh, good results. And um, yeah, we should uh, take it from there and continue to uh, let the worlds of IT and shipping meet. Thank you. My name is Christopher Rix, and I'm Head of Innovation and Research at Daniship Finance. Daniship Finance is a bank. We are basically a one-trick pony financing ships. We have approximately 800 of them at the moment, um, and my job is to write reports and speak, and then it's basically trying to see how we can upgrade the, or help our customers upgrade the performance and thereby their return on investor capital and the underlying business models. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Klaus Quinter Graugard, and I'm representing the Merce McKinney Miller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. I'm heading uh, the area in the center that we call onboard vessel solutions, so mainly all around the ship technologies and energy efficiencies and so forth. We have a clear mission that we're working on in the center is uh, to work on, on strategizing and solutions towards how we can decarbonize the entire industry for, for shipping. So 
trying to capture the immense problem of uh, burning 300 million tons of fuel oil, getting close to one gigaton of uh, CO2 emissions as we speak. Uh, we have uh, at this stage identified three main programs that we will be working intensively with uh, going forward and that will be related to uh, alternative uh, low carbon and zero carbon fuels, uh, basically about how to bring down the cost of these and how to uh, deploy alternative fuels in the world fleet. Secondly, we will be working intensively on a, pro a program called uh, Realizing Energy Efficiencies. goes very well with what we're discussing today. And this will definitely capture both elements around uh, hardware solutions, but certainly also digitalization and how we can see smart shipping being integrated to, to support this. The third program area that we will be focusing in on our efforts will be called Enabling the First Mover. And I think this has also been mentioned uh, several times this morning that this is very, very important. How can we get demonstrators out there? How can we de-risk those who actually want to put money at stake uh, to start investing into uh, demonstrating new solutions for uh, both new ship types, fuel types, uh, energy solutions, and so forth. And cutting across all this, we will be working intensely on the advocacy, namely with uh, policy making and regulation and trying to support regulators and policy makers in creating more clear guidance, what makes sense for sustainability solutions for our industry. Great, thank you very much. So now we're gonna move into uh, a few questions. We'll ask the panel. We can have some good discussion around that up here on the stage and then we'll open up for a Q&A afterwards. So kind of the first question for me towards the panel is if we look at decarbonization and a lot of times, if, especially from the outside in, in the press, a lot of it focuses on fuels, future fuels, ammonia, methanol, the back and forth, right? But kind of getting a little bit deeper into the technology, I'd like to ask the panel, what is your view on what kind of digital tools and solutions are currently missing from the mix to help drive this transition towards zero? Um, and even to kind of follow up, then what do you see as kind of the game changer on the horizon to really drive us towards this future? Okay, that's better, yes, uh, thank you very much. No, I think uh, overall, uh, definitely, as I mentioned before, from, from the work that we are doing when we're looking at strategizing uh, the transition for the entire industry, fuels cannot do it on its own. Fuel is, is, uh, is a part of the solution, and on the long term, maybe uh, zero carbon fuels will be, be, uh, be the solution uh, 30 or 40 years down the road. But the transition to get there, energy efficiencies and, and uh, and the way that we, we look at the, at the power demand for the entire fleet will be very, very important because the scale and the magnitude of how fast we can get there require that we, we really save on the power demand and the fuel consumption uh, along the way. Um, and some of the solutions, as I think, is very well connected with the presentation we just had from, uh, from Peter, uh, from Merce Tankers, actually. I would like to see that these uh, data sharing platforms gets much more across, not just in isolated uh, pools, that is with one single operator, but we can get data sharing platforms and uh, they, across the industry to become much more transparent. This will unlock a huge potential about how efficiently and how cleverly we drive uh, vessels. And when, we, when Peter, Peter was giving good examples about the, 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 the position, the place, and the right time, if this was coming across the world fleet, not just for isolated uh, players having maybe 100, 200, or 300, or 600 vessels in a pool, but actually looking at several thousand vessels so that we are actually targeting the right vessels at the right place at the right time to transport uh, the cargoes, this would remove so many ballast legs where we're not gaining any value for the, for the CO2. Yeah, and, and if I never from Sure North, I think I say actually one of the reasons that we spun out Sure North out of Merce Tankers was exactly that, right? Was that, that uh, there was not a belief that one could just do it on their own, that it has to be, uh, it has to be uh, independent and it has to be transparent. So, so I fully echo transparency of what's actually happening on the oceans. And that transparency then needs to go into uh, aligning the incentive between the cargo owner, the operator, and, and the vessel owner. There's simply too much mistrust uh, some would even say a little bit of cheating here and there, uh, but but there's definitely mistrust and it's probably coming from somewhere, right? So so you need one platform where there is like six, eight, twenty thousand vessels where where you collect all that data, 
and through that you will actually uh, encourage the collaboration. And in order for you to get the access to that data, you need to build software solution that's providing value now. So I think that's kind of the whole strategy of Synoth is that you provide something that gives you value and therefore you're willing to share your data that can then be reused in an anonymous and aggregated format that can drive the transparency for the, everybody else on the platform. So I think that's really that whole data flywheel effect is, is immensely important for us to succeed here. And, and, and that's why I think partnerships and consultation is, is, is uh, quite key. Yes, sir. Thank you. I totally agree and follow all the hopes and dreams of data sharing and data platforms. But I think the most important part is that when we're looking into zero, car zero carbon fuels or whatever we would like to label them, the two common words they're sharing is complex and, and costly. So we are basically in need of a business plan. We, we need to have something that is scalable beyond what we, today we like to talk about multi-fuel scenarios and fuel corridors. This is basically creating dead ends if, if, if we cannot scale them. So we need to understand how can we actually, also for the tram industries, how can we begin to actually see we are delivering more value, we are cost savings, and yes, we are also bridging the additional fuel costs, whether we talk about carbon levies, taxes, global legislation, whatever, blah, blah. But we need to find out how the cash flows, cash flows are beginning to meet and actually are we begin creating more value than, than, uh, than just seeing more costs being built up into the system. The return on invested capital across the board these days are already quite low, so the ability to absorb additional costs is relatively weak. Please ignore the current boom in, in container and drywall for that comment. But, uh. I have uh, one thing to add, and, uh, and, and I agree with what being said, but if we want to share this data and create this ecosystem of trust where we're actually sharing data across different players in the industry, we're also lacking standardization. And we need to have that format that we can actually trustly share that data and everybody understand the format, because if we don't get there, we continue to be, you know, we're not comparing apples with apples. Uh, and we're not driving towards uh, towards the decarbonisation. Yeah. yeah, is it on? Yeah. Uh, so I don't think technology is uh, is is the problem here because if you look at technology in other sectors, I mean there is so much available and uh, also. At Port Exchange, we work with people who have worked in insurance and banking. If you see all the, the technologies that they bring from there, it's more about bridging the gap with, uh, with the maritime industry. And also, um, this is not a, a digitalization revolution. It's, it's really change management that uh, needs to be going on. Because if you just turn on uh, some fancy IT system with visibility and all the data that people may need, and they continue to work in their old processes, you're not going to move the needle. So it's extremely important to really approach it as a, a change management project and uh, not as an IT project. Who's the blocker then in the change management? I mean, who is, who's not facilitating this, right? Because if you're saying the technology's there, there's obviously a need, then why isn't it happening? Yeah, I think the question should be who is facilitating it? Because uh, in the end, it's collaboration. If you just focus on your own processes, you can only get this far. If you start collaborating, and in the end, a port call, the area that I'm working in, is a, a joint process where multiple parties work together. So if you start collaborating, that's where you get to, to a next level of, uh, of optimization. And who should be the driver of that? That's the big question. I mean, shared accountability generally is uh, no accountability. And then it doesn't happen. Yeah, I think it has to be those that are actually paying the fuel bills. They have to have the transparency and they have to have the tools at hand so they can drive it throughout the, the, the supply chain. And, and especially in tram, where we're focusing, that's not happening, right? Because often it is the decision by the, by the crews on the vessel that's to some extent not even working for the ship owner because they're working for the technical manager that has appointed a technical man at the, the crews and then they charter out the vessel. So, so then, like, okay, let's empower those that are sitting at shore that eventually will be rewarded, and, and those are the ones paying the fuel bill. And, and we need to start with those. Yep. And then we need to flip around and, and have that conversation proactively with the vessel uh, of saying and, and ensuring that that is still, of course, weather safe and, and that we listen and, and understand what's going on in the vessel. I'm not trying to debate that we shouldn't listen to there. But we need to connect them and we need to drive it from those that is paying the fuel bill. And those will then also be more willing to sponsor and go into a dialogue around new fuels if they can see that they are being benefited from it. But they can't today because they're not empowered and they don't get the insights, right? 
is like I, I send a, a speed claim if you don't perform, and then you can debate that one. And then the only one that's making money is the legal uh, advisors helping you on, on that one. That actually but helping the climate at least. Yeah, Christian. No, to to add to this also, you know, we need to on the on the way we actually do our business, we need to move from from working in a post-mortem way of doing things into bringing it into real time. Because that's actually the need, assessing how you, good you were at doing a specific voids, post the voids, that's not enough. You need to do it continuously throughout the voids. That's the only way you continue to optimize and, and your energy efficiency. Weather chains, ETA chains, trim chains, and, and so on. So, so you need to be there in real time. And that absolutely, as Dita said, is not only us just about uh, change management, but it's also incorporating that behavioral change into both your onboard crew and also your frontline teams on shore. Klaus? No, I think that's, that's a great comment, uh, Christian, the digital twin opportunity there and how we can actually advise ships uh, uh, online and, and, and actual measures. But I think from our perspective, what we see at the center with our program on energy efficiency is uh, we don't necessarily see that there's a need for us immediately to go and find these new state-of-the-art solutions. But if we can support by conceptualizing and illustrating how the best practices can actually uh, be deployed and, and what potential it is, I think this is a great uh, starting point for the industry because if you take the best practices, the best engineering, the best solutions for hardware and the best uh, operational practices and put them into realization, then the potential is huge. I don't have the numbers, but it's definitely on the other side of savings of 20 to 25 percent, I would think. So, so conceptualizing this and making sure that that the, the smaller and medium operators who might not be at this level yet understand the, uh, the potential and then how the, the, the one who pays the fuel bill actually gets connected to that. And then connecting it regulation on the carbon intensities and actually setting sufficiently high ambitions and connecting all this in an ecosystem. I think this is a very good starting point for the immediate transition. Yep, Dita. I just wanted to add to the to the numbers on that because we did some data analysis on uh, uh, the ports that are live on uh, Port Exchange, and we see that the potential is really huge. So we calculated the impact of using a collaboration platform in a port, and calculations is obviously not the same as measuring, but uh, yeah, it could uh, reduce anchor time by three hours on average. And if you then look at the real data, so uh, measured data, then we're looking at uh, uh, NO2 emission reduction of about 25%. So just by collaborating and exchanging data, and that's a benefit for everybody, right? Also for ports who are located close to a city who need to watch their NO2 emissions and want to reduce anchor time. So the, the benefits are, are huge. Yeah, but you talked about also what is the roadblocks, and and what we see is is there's quite a few big players, and and most being one of them, and also in the dry bulk industry, there's there's a bigger players, and they do a lot on their own, and and that's fine because that benefits them. But if you don't do it on a wider industry level, and that we actually help the the long tail of the industry, then I actually think it will be a far stretch because the, it, right now vessel optimization is actually being regarded as a competitive edge meaning that I'm keeping it very close to my heart and to myself, because if I give it away, uh, that is actually, when I charter a vessel, if I can move it more efficiently from A to B, then that's actually, I can price down the cargo and I can make more money, right? And, and I think that's just not the, the best way for, for us to move as an industry if we are to decarbonize. We, we have to have something that, and I don't say it has to be so north, at least we will give it a go. If somebody else wins the market, they probably did a, a hopefully a very good job, because we will at least push them very hard to win it. <laughs> but if we're not, then at least I think we need to have somebody that, that actually as an industry recognized push the industry. And there should not be a competitive edge for anybody to do was vessel optimization. It should just be a stand of the industry. Yeah. Well, along that, some of the themes we're talking about here, as well as you mentioned, who pays the fuel bill, right? We have business models in this industry that reduce the incentive for ship owners to invest in technology. So I guess a question I'd have for the panel here is, is thinking about that, that that gap, how can we incentivize ship owners who, again, aren't incentivized to invest in new digital solutions or digital tools, focusing on the digitization side, how can we convince them to invest in their vessels, knowing they don't 
you know, reap the benefits at the end of the day. Yeah, no, I think that's a fundamental problem with the, the structure of the charter party structures that we see, see out there today. And, and, and fortunately, there is work going on in various organizations to, to change that. But this is one of the, the enablers that needs to be equally changed together with technologies and, and, and introduction of, uh, of best practices. Because if the business model doesn't channel, you can say, the motivation to the, to the one who pays the bill, then it, it's never going to fly. Uh, so we need to have that uh, that that roadblock removed in, in the business models, and this is hurting because this is some of some of these uh, structures are 200 years old. And this has been the fundamental of how we drive ships and how we trade ships, uh, and and but this is this is the time now to to change this. And I think also we can see examples where sometimes when I'm in discussion with uh, ports and terminal operators, how do they actually take responsibility for vessels coming into their area on if that might be their scope three emissions. Well, they're very focused also on their scope one and through, uh, two emissions right now to solve that because that's hard enough for them. But if ports and terminal are not all likewise motivated to make sure that we are getting vessels in in just in time, then how is that going to, to open up? And why can shipping not operate on slot timings like we see in aviation? They still competitively uh, drive the airplanes and they land on very, very narrow slots of timings. So how can we not get this, uh, you can say, this uh, sequence of, of slot timing into the, uh, the way we operate the ships? It must be feasible. The big I the issue is that an airplane drops out of the sky if you're, too, if you're running out of fuel. A ship, you can drop the anchor and wait. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's not been so hardly encouraged for safety reasons so far, but it should be feasible. Yes, sir. Thank you, Klaus. I, I largely agree. I think another element is there as well that the, today it's most commonly the asset game that is dictating most of the value creation for many ship owners. I think that if we are business model innovating that what we are talking about, we are also beginning to see that the cash yield from the cash flow from the operation of the ship should actually begin to deliver uh, value in their, in their own right. So it is not necessarily the case today across cycles. So I think that if we are reinventing the operating model and the ownership model, so owners are not just passive uh, owners of, uh, maybe not super passive, but uh, not just owning and waiting for other somebody else to operate them, but actually integrating them uh, the operations. I think that we can begin to solve this. And in fact, I think here we have a good interplay between the decommunization effort and the digitalization efforts because in many challenges today when we're talking about decarbonization, we need to have some kind of clarity that what kind of employment profile should we expect to see and somebody will guarantee the, the, uh, um, the, the employment of the ship from A to B in a certain, way, in a certain period. And this is basically a process of very reducing the influence of the, of the spot market uh, over to a more contract-based scheme. So this could begin to eliminate some of the volatility and, and thereby that's the game. Mm. Yeah, and I guess regulations will help a little bit on this as well, right? So I think at least we've seen the when uh, now lately with the CII coming out that that the owners are beginning to get very uh, concerned because uh, if if you speed up and and you're not deciding the speed, then suddenly you are getting hammered, right? So I think that the regulation is something that that needs to help uh, facilitate this uh, journey, and and make, and then of course that goes back into and and quite a lot of owners are in in a head break right now of saying, okay, how do we actually regulate our charter parties on the vessels not going too fast because that will actually hamper our own ability on the CI. And I think it's rightfully seen that, that it has to go on the ship owner and not on the charter. That, that, that is the one that can break the, the silos um, between them. Mm. But is this, I mean, is there a solution around data sharing as well? I mean, what can demand a higher TC rate, right? Help incentivize things. And as Christian just talked about, going from a noon report to a real-time kind of data flow to drive performance. Is there a solution there somewhere? Yeah. It's, I don't think you. I don't think you need live data. I don't think this is a. It's not a like sensible on like every ten seconds that you have to do something. If you just have enough vessels, I think honestly a good new report you get much further than you realize. But but uh, it's, but it's about trusting uh, the data around it, right? So it's it's more probably like getting uh, accurate weather data. I think is super important because that has immense, probably the biggest impact on the vessel. 
on, on what's actually happening on that and being able to forecast that, right? So super accurate weather forecasting is, is what can, can drive it. And, and yes, I think Peter Schroeder also mentioned you need the sensor data and the order log data to calibrate across. So if you have like 10% of the market with sensor data and you have like 90% of the rest with noon pods, I actually think those two in combination will give you an immensely strong data set that will create the transparency of what's happening on the oceans. And if you have that transparency, you can business uh, model innovate. Mm. But, but that will take quite a long time before you have that, right? Mm. Klaus? Yeah, no, but I think to your question on, on, on what could maybe help breaking the ice, inevitably with, with new fuels as being part of the solutions to bring down your trajectory of uh, carbon intensity of your operation, this will be more expensive products. So as you are getting pushed more and more towards these more expensive products, there will also be a, a, a straightforward, better business case in retrofitting your vessels and operating them smarter. So now is really the time to get that connect to who's paying the bill and who's actually wanting to, to make the savings because the fuel will be two and a half, three times more expensive potentially until scaling is there and the transition has happened uh, 20 to 30 years down the road. So the next 10 to 20 years is really the opportunity that investments will become more and more and more in the money. Uh, so we should be able to drive that opportunity uh, and, and, and share the, the upsides. This is actually a little off topic then, but going towards, will we'll, you know, if we look at financing for ships as well, sorry, Christian, I'll let you go, but looking at financing for ships, I mean, do we see that ESG goals are gonna start pushing these, these you know, the vessel market towards, let's say, different solutions? I think it's quite clear these days that both uh, equity investors but also debt providers are increasingly focused on, on uh, having a more clear and distinct ESG profile on, on, on what we are doing. Um, but of course, we cannot force any change that is not possible out there at the moment. So I mean, all of us would like to be much more decarbonized at the moment, but there's not project enough out there to, to actually do it. So it's, it's a delicate balance. We need to push enough so we can see the changes happening, but we also need to, to be realistic about what can actually be feasible and where we still have a business case to finance. And, and, and if we uh, are just looking a little bit, I think you mentioned uh, right now with the container and dry, dry bulk, uh, it doesn't take a magic bullet to see how fast the vessels are going right now. I don't think the industry have ever polluted as much as they do right now. Mm. It's like the, the, all the vessels have been plowing uh, off. If they could uh, go any faster, they would in the dry bulk and, and the container market, right? So, so I think we need to be mindful that this is a U.S. dollar driven business and people will go for the U.S. dollar first mm -hmm. and then the mission's fine. I think it's nice that we have... Uh, agendas and, and conversation around the decompensation and uh, at least my kids like that we have those conversations but but it is a dollar driven business and if you don't link them then then that will not change and and it will come with the new fuels uh, definitely because that that will help and regulations and so on right but it's, it's, a, it's a very relevant comment, and if you if you look at the uh, the vessels that are now operating on LNG, which you would think was introduced there because you would like to take that as an opportunity to save on your emissions, now LNG is triple the price of uh, of fuel oil. So what are you operating on? Because you're on dual fuel. Well, if you ask the majority of these operators, I think they'll be operating on fuel oil, right? So where's the incentive of actually doing the good for the environment? This is gone because of the business case. So this is regulation needs to push it in order to make sure we go on these uh, the hard set targets on carbon intensities. And enforcement must be, uh, must be available as well because it's not enough that we have a target, but the enforcement needs to be, uh, be there and be ready from, from day one. Last comment from Dita before we go to Q&A. Yeah, this is indeed a money-driven uh, business, and uh, emissions would have to go into the business case in order to also play a role in that. Otherwise, you're always going to prioritize making money over uh, longer-term uh, benefits and goals, uh, which are uh, even more important, I would, I would say. Uh, but therefore, also, it's important that you're able to measure emissions in a good way, uh, and also a way that everybody agrees on, um, uh, yeah, that that's correct. Great. So, turning over to Q&A. Rob, do you want to help out on microphones here? So, we'll start taking some questions from the audience. Well, thank you. It's actually just more of a, of a comment because I completely agree with what has been uh, said, uh, especially about the split incentive, and we need regulation there. So, 
if we come back to what the EU is proposing right now, we are right now fighting for the definition of the legal entity. So who is actually responsible to, to, uh, to surrender the allowance in the ETS system? We argue that it should be the DOC holder, because then you have one the dock holder, then you have one point of entry in terms of enforcement. Others, I'm sorry, I, it's, my, I, I, it's my favorite uh, pick on topic, our Greek colleagues are arguing that it should be the operator because they say, well, the polluter should pay, we have no power over, over the charter. Well, we completely agree, of course it's the polluter who should pay. Whoever sets the speed, pays for the fuel, should also pay. But we need for enforcement purposes, but we also need in order to drive the transition, we need to have the owners apart. We all need to pull in the same direction. So that's why we need you know, the DOC holder as a legal enti entity. And we're gonna fight for that. But uh, so if anybody agrees here, if you ever come to Brussels and you speak to regulators there, please echo this. It's incredibly important. <laughs> Thank you. Or maybe just on that topic, because I think it might be a question of who's your audience here? Who's the end customer? Because if you talk about, um, you know, we're all discussing this as, as the maritime uh, industry, and there's different parts of that, there's different, different uh, angles towards uh, what we can do and how, and how quickly. And there's regulations and there's triggers for, you know, the implementation of, of technologies, which are clearly there. And that's all, you know, and, and it is a dollar driven business. but if I hear Dita say about this example of NO2 reduction, 25%, it's unbelievable. That's, that, that's, a, that's a number that in certain industries would be looked at, at, would kind of be frowned upon, like, is this really possible? So two things on that. One, I think we owe it to ourselves um, as the industry to kind of go out and do it, um, uh, one way or the other. But the, the, the very interesting aspect of it is that your audience, which is actually the end customer, that could be all of us, could be the consumers, who say, well, okay, so you're saying now, um, if you don't do it, if you don't show it that we have the capabilities and if we don't implement it, then our end customers might kind of say, okay, you, you tell us now that you could save 25% and you're not doing it, bye-bye. And I'm, I'm realizing that, that that is not that quickly to do, but we should not under underestimate the power of the end uh, customer could be a very important trigger, I think. So it's not really a question; it's more a common drop. No, I just I, I agree, of course, but maybe and and Christian, you have a, probably a strong view. I think it's an easier statement in a, in the container market because you're a little bit closer there, right? I think tram shipping. Uh, so, uh, what do you do now on your gasoline car? Where do you buy your fuel for your gasoline car? Because they didn't optimize going into Rotterdam, uh, like uh, so, you don't want to buy from somebody. Like you don't know. That's my point, right? You have absolutely no idea how that fuel came to Denmark, so you don't know what other behavior changes you can do as a as a personal uh, consumer uh, in the supply chain of the tram shipping. And I think that is a challenge that 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 is that we are too far away from the end consumer. Yeah. Just do one more question. My question is here, are we looking at decarbonization in the maritime industry? Um, are we looking in the right spot? Because we're looking right now, all talking scope one emissions. We're talking about direct emissions. Are we repeating the same learnings or some learnings we should have from other industries looking at decarbonization? We should look at the industry as a whole. That means also scope three emissions from upstream and downstream from the whole vessel operation and from the whole vessel um, handling. Are we just looking at the fuel? Is that good enough? Uh, or are we making decisions that we don't know what will the implications be down the line? We do too, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a great uh, question. And uh, definitely I, I support that this is not just uh, about scope one. You need to go through all scopes, all three scopes. It's, it's need to be a priority to uh, to drive this, and it need to go across the whole uh, value chain of of shipping industry. Yeah, yeah that's really class. Yes, uh, certainly. Yeah, this this is for us uh, working on on you can say that the the pathways of of the way to net zero. Um, 
definitely we will look at this in a life cycle perspective and, and we look at all our solutions from a, from an end to end solution from the from the the well to tank and the tank to wake and and putting everything into a total totality context because it doesn't make sense and i think this is also being realized now at the IMO but it's difficult because the methodology is about creating the LCA uh, framework and the methodology is not straightforward uh, it's not just a uh, phase 3 in a book and then you go so we need to get that in place and, and, and have that as a fundamental basis about how we, how we calculate the carbon accounting, because without it, uh, then we might be making the wrong choices. Can I, can I just add to that? Because I think we are, it is super important that we are not missing an additional point here, that when the global economy, now we have 65% of the global GDP is now committed to a net zero commitment by 2050. So this is basically to say that we are beginning to consider not just how the transportation works, but how the underlying industries that we are serving is working. So to my understanding, we are looking into a scenario where we can basically begin to see trade volume shrinking in some ship segments. We can see trading patterns changing a lot, parcel sizes, and all, all, basically the whole ecosystem around global trade is, is about to change. So this is significantly beyond the fuel impact. Great. Well, I don't want to keep everyone out away from their lunch. Sure. So just, just a comment, uh, I'll be very quick, I don't want to hold you for lunch, but uh, there was a conversation about data sharing and, uh, you know, who's blocking, why we're not able to do it. I think it's very important that we, we're deadly honest on what are the frictions elements that prevent us to achieve what we, at least in this audience, we all agree it's an Evan Lee, Evan Lee uh, scenario. And if we don't do that, we're not keeping ourselves honest. So. Information asymmetry is a driver for competitive advantage, full stop. There is a number of companies that do benefit from information asymmetry. I would like to see some of the big OEMs come here and tell us that they're ready to open their data protocols. That when you hook up to an automation system, you do it for free. That's not happening, right? So that's one element. Regulation is extremely important, but it hurts. Some of the ship manager, and we're giving away for free data collection mechanisms, and we give away the bandwidth to bring this data onshore for free. And still, and I'm quoting, I had a ship manager told me, I don't want to create a problem to myself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at this. I think that if we say who's blocking, I don't know, et cetera, et cetera that's, that's not happening. Let's be deadly serious and keep ourselves honest that there are commercial interests and legitimate commercial interests behind not sharing the data. Let's think about what's, you know, Japan is trying to do a lot of stuff with cheap DC. You probably know about this. But if we don't do this, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it hurts, right? It hurts us to do that type of exercise. But I think that's necessary. Thank you. So to kind of summarize real quick, as I said at the beginning, our industry is, is far behind a lot of other industries within heavy industry, right, in, in those verticals. But I don't think it's through a lack of willingness, right? There's lots of companies in this room today that are providing technologies that can significantly drive decarbonization, can save bunker, safety, reliability. There's also lots of owner operators in this room that have that desire, that have that want and that need. But as we see from the discussion today, there's a lo this is complex, right? Be it on a business model side or regulatory side, this industry is very complex, and in, we know it's conservative, but it's conservative for a reason as well. And so the only way we can solve these type of issues is through this, through getting together, discussing, meeting, talking, sharing ideas. That's the future for us in the long run. Let's give the panel here a round of applause, please.